Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We will start in another minute. All right, welcome everyone. We will start in about 10 seconds. Great to see everyone here. Happy spring. <clears throat> All right, we are just two minutes after the hour and we're gonna get started with our Regional Community Coalition meeting. Dr. Matt, could you please start us with the welcome? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good thank you, afternoon for everyone, maybe morning for some folks. But thank you so much for joining us today. Participation um, in the past event and we appreciate it today. So we're going to transform the health outcomes of this nation with your help. Thank you so much, and I turn it back over to Kristen. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Hall, the Director of Community Engagement with uh, here at Morehouse School of Medicine for, with the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network. I'm so excited to welcome you to our Regional Community Coalition meeting because today we will have three strategic partners who will share their expertise, their best practices and ideas for engaging their communities. They will also discuss the results of their COVID-19 efforts, and also share the partnerships that were involved in creating resilient communities. Before we get into their presentations, I, there are a few meeting instructions and details that I wanna go over before we get started. This meeting is being recorded and we also have live transcription captioning available. And if you would like to access that, please click the CC or closed caption button to view subtitles. We also have simultaneous Spanish language translation. And to use that function, please select the globe icon at the bottom of the screen and then select the Spanish language. We also have an American Sign Language interpreter team made up of Jennifer Needleman and Chelsea Nagel. To pin their video, please hover over their screen and click the three small dots at the top right corner. You can also click view in the top right corner to adjust your speaker viewing preference. Because of the large number of participants, we ask that you please mute yourself throughout the meeting. You will have a chance to ask our presenters questions. And when that opportunity um, comes about, if you want to speak, please unmute yourself and begin by saying your name and sharing any pronouns um, if you feel comfortable. And we want to hear from you and we want you to be engaged. So you can chat with presenters and our attendees during the meeting by using the chat function. And if you haven't already done so, please introduce yourself and where you're from and what organization you, re you represent in the chat box. Again, we do welcome your participation throughout this event. However, um, any disrespectful or inappropriate comments will not be tolerated, and we reserve the right to limit and or remove anyone from the meeting displaying such behavior. If you, as an attendee, have a concern regarding someone's comments, whether they be verbal or written, please reach out to an NSERN staff directly. You have the option to um, turn your video on or off by selecting the video function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any Zoom technical issues, please type those tech 
issues into the chat box, first by typing Zoom help, and our Zoom tech guide will assist you with that. For questions that are not related to any technical issues, please type those in the chat box at any time during the event, and one of the intern staff members will respond to those questions as we get them. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be available several days um, following this event, as well as a written transcript. Again, I want to thank you all for um, attending this meeting. Um, there are gonna be many great speakers that you will hear from today. And please join me now in welcoming Dr. Tabia Akintobi, who is the Strategic Advisor for the NCERN Community Engagement Corps. Thank you so much, Christine, and thanks to all of you for joining us today for what we know is going to be an insightful opportunity to learn and hear what your colleagues from across the nation have done uh, to advance COVID-19 resilience. Uh, so just a little about NCERN for those who may be new to us. Um, Morehouse School of Medicine um, coordinates a strategic and structured national network, which we call NCERN, or the National COVID-19 Resiliency Network. And it's really designed to provide awareness and culturally appropriate and responsive health, health education information, as well as linkages to care, which you can find through our website. Uh, and these linkages are to not just COVID, but all of those social, political, and immediate needs that people have. And so you can go to our website to find out more about what NCERN is doing and to be linked to local resources where you work, live, lead, play, and serve communities. And so at the end of the day, this network is for, created for community and by community, and it's governed by community leaders across the nation, state, territories, and tribes, and that represent racial, ethnic, um, uh, geographically representative, as well as other priority population groups, which we know are important in leading efforts uh, to be resilient um, in the wake of COVID-19. Next slide, please. And so um, uh, this is what NCERN is. And um, just to give you a reminder, you know, in expanding what Christine shared, this regional community coalition is designed to bring together all the regions of the US through this opportunity to learn of the successes and lessons learned through the COVID-19 uh, vaccine and education, as well as promotion efforts. And these are those that are not only led by NCERN. And so that's why this is a national and global opportunity for you to not just hear and learn, but also to contribute as Christine described. So we look forward to your participation, you sharing insights, lessons learned and opportunities from where you live and lead in addressing and, and responding to communities for COVID and beyond. So finally, we want to explore innovative and sustainability strategies for work beyond COVID. And we certainly need your leadership and insights to do that. So we look forward to an, an interactive, insightful um, opportunity today. And hopefully you also develop and expand your own networks. Dr. Mack, you ready to introduce Dr. Rubidell? Yes. Again, thank you, Dr. Hack and Toby. Um, as Dr. Hack and Toby stated, the purpose of this network is to engage our diverse partnerships and also highlight um, our diverse partners. Um, it's important to do this and to share best practices among the community of how we should engage, but also provide services. So it's my honor today to introduce Dr. Yvette Rubido. Um, Dr. Rubido, um, want to thank AAIP, the Association of American Indian Physicians, for helping us to get Dr. Rubido here today. Um, just a little bit about her background is an American Indian physician, researcher, and public health advocate. He most recently served as the director of the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians 
and she served as the director of the Indian Health Service in the Obama administration. Her prior academic work focused on the quality of diabetes care, American Indian health policy, and recruitment of American Indian and Alaskan Native students into medical and research professions. She is a past president of the American Association of the Association of American Indian Physicians and is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Today, Dr. Rubido will share her and the physician's perspective on COVID-19 efforts in American Indian, Alaska Native priority population. Dr. Rubido, I'm honored to present the mic to you. Thank you for being here and we look forward to hearing from you. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to project my slides. And I think that helped you see it. All right, and I think you can hear me as well. So that's great. Well, again, uh, hello everybody. I'm Dr. Yvette Rubido. I'm an American Indian. I'm a member or citizen of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe on my father's side and a descendant of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe on my mother's side. Hold on, I need to do one thing. All right, there we go. Great, well, I am speaking today in my capacity as a member of the Association of American Indian Physicians or AAIP. Thank you so much for the opportunity to showcase the work of the Association of American Indian Physicians on COVID-19 and influenza vaccination. I'd like to thank the Association of American Indian Physicians, Margaret Knight, and also Gail Marshall and Kelly Begay for their help in preparing for this session. And thank you to all of those attending for the important work you do in this area. Your work is so important for all the people that you serve. All right, well, first, the Association of American Indian Physicians, or AAIP, was established by 14 Native physicians in 1971 to provide a forum to support each other and for their commitment to Native American health care. The mission is listed here. It's really to pursue excellence in Native American health care, and AAIP does a lot of work supporting current American Indian and Alaska Native physicians, recruiting American Indians and Alaska Natives into the health professions, and honoring traditional Indian medicine and its role in wellness. The AAIP membership work in a variety of diverse settings. So I have a question for the audience. You can put your answer in the chat. How many American Indian and Alaska Native physicians are there in the US right now? So just put your response in the chat. Just take a guess. All right, we're getting some responses of how many American Indian Alaska Native physicians in the US right now. It's a wide range. You're doing well. Let's get a few more guesses and then I'll show you the, the latest amount. All right, well, I guess it depends on how we count it um, and how we define how we're counting it. But in terms of the latest data from the Association of American Medical Colleges, um, there are currently um, 2,583 self-identified American Indian Alaska Native, but only self-identified as checking off alone of the 841,000 total physicians in the US. So it's only 0.3%. So we're actually the most underrepresented group of in all of the physicians according to race and ethnicity. So that's uh, a big challenge. Uh, so we are trying to recruit more American and West Native physicians. Now, if you were to add the people who are in combination, I don't know where that would get you, but um, yeah, so. 
Anyway, first, I just want to talk a little bit about the population uh, that we're talking about today. American Indians and Alaska Natives represent a very diverse group of individuals uh, who are from the 574 federally recognized tribal nations. Um, and these nations are sovereign nations, and they have the right to govern their people, lands, and resources. And they have a right to a government to government relationship with the federal government. There are also state recognized tribes. So American Indians and Alaska Natives are very diverse. And these tribal nations that they come from have a wide range of distinct cultures, languages, and traditions. And American Indians and Alaska Natives also live on or near reservations or tribal lands and in urban areas. And in fact, you probably know this, the vast majority of American Indians and Alaska Natives who self-identify as American Indian and Alaska Native live in or near urban areas. And so there's also a very wide diversity in social determinants of health, including a very wide range of economic diversity. So American Indians and Alaska Natives are very diverse within the population, which has a lot of implications for social marketing and public health campaigns. Now, the 2020 census data so far indicate that there are 9.7 million people in the US that self-identify as American Indians, Alaska Natives alone or in combination with other races. And this is actually a pretty big increase since 2010. So the population is rapidly growing. American Indians and Alaska Natives are usually discussed in the context of getting healthcare in the Indian Health Service, a federal healthcare system mostly on or near reservations or tribal lands. However, it's now more correct to refer to it as the Indian Health System. And that has three distinct components, the federally run Indian Health Service and its facilities, or IHS, tribally managed health programs and their fac facilities, and urban Indian health organizations that receive a very small amount of funding from the Indian Health Service for some health services, even though the majority of American Indians, Alaska Natives live in urban areas. However, American Indians, Alaska Natives also may be eligible for or receive care through the various other components of the US healthcare system as listed on the right. So, any public health initiatives targeting American Indians, Alaska Natives have to consider these sources as well. And many of you may have American Indians in your patient or service population or community. So raise your Zoom hand if you work in a community where you serve any American Indians and Alaska Natives. Just take a minute to do that. If you think you have American Indians and Alaska Natives in your uh, uh, community you serve, Raise your Zoom hand. All right. We're getting some people to raise their hands. And actually, I think if you look at your um, statistics, uh, at some point, you might realize you, many more of you uh, serve American Indians and Alaska Natives. We're literally everywhere. All right, next slide is. So many of you probably know that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted American Indians and Alaska Natives in, during the pandemic. And since the beginning of the pandemic, and even now in this latest data from CDC, American Indians and Alaska Natives are still experiencing higher cases, hospitalization, and deaths from COVID-19 compared to other racial and ethnic groups. This slide shows that the, um, for example, cases in American Indian Alaska Natives are 1.6 times higher than cases in non-Hispanic whites. So according to the CDC, when we go back to the early part of the pandemic, um, the incidence of COVID-19 in American Indians and Alaska Natives was actually a, a much higher ratio than this. Does anybody know um, the ratio? Uh, back in the beginning of the pandemic. It's 1.6 times more than white non-Hispanic persons. Does anybody know what it was in the first year of the pandemic? Go ahead and write that in the chat if you know um, how many times greater it was in the early pandemic. Write your answer in the chat. Go ahead, take a guess. It was more than 1.6 
times. So you'll be you'll be right if you say more than that. <laughs> Anybody got a guess? All right. Well, thank you for being brave and and guessing. It was actually 3.5 times that of non-Hispanic white persons in the first year of the pandemic. So even though it has come down, it is still the highest of other racial and ethnic groups. So COVID-19 is still a big issue for American Indians and Alaska Natives. In terms of influenza, American Indians, Alaska Natives have also been disproportionately impacted also. And in this graph of rates of influenza or flu hospitalizations over the past seven years, American Indians and Alaska Natives have been among the highest rates of hospitalization as indicated by the orange line on this graph, especially in the last couple of years. So influenza is also uh, an issue for American Indians and Alaska Natives. So why are American Indians and Alaska Natives facing a higher risk of disparities related to COVID-19 and influenza? I think you know the answers already. These reasons are common in other groups, but are magnified in the American Indian Alaska Native population. You can see them on the slide, lack of access to healthcare, um, lack of transportation, underfunding of the Indian health system, crowded housing conditions with multiple generations living together, a lack of water and sanitation systems, high prevalence of conditions that increase risk, language, health literacy, communication barriers, and many other reasons. Despite all these challenges, before the pandemic, the Indian Health Service reported general vaccination rates that were among or the highest general vaccination rates in the United States. So despite all the challenges, the Indian health system of care has advantages of being a large healthcare system, linking all these diverse IHS, tribal, and urban Indian health programs with the capability for centralized distribution of messaging and medication and vaccines quickly. And so, in fact, many uh, sites, including many tribal communities, were able to achieve some very high vaccination rates early on. There was also already a lot of baseline knowledge of the need to adapt public health messages to local culture, positive messages on focused on community and culture, and the risk to elders was also a risk to culture and traditions. So messaging to protect the community, our futures, our people, and our traditions were very important and effective and much more effective than individually focused messages. So messages that folk on, focus on what I need or uh, me don't work as well as what can happen, uh, what we can do for our community as well. That works a lot better. And I also think that sharing the success, success stories of the tribes early in the pandemic and positive messages was very motivating. But even so, based on the current data on COVID-19 impact and vaccinations for American Indians and Alaska Natives overall, the need for vaccination is still a huge issue. The latest COVID-19 vaccination data from the CDC on the left and from IHS on the right show that along with the rest of the country, there is still a lot more work to do to get more people updated with the latest bivalent booster dose. 
The CDC data on the left show that IHS is actually lagging behind the national average at 7% of the total population being vaccinated with a bivalent booster compared to the US of 16%. You can see that on this map, IHS at the bottom is a light green and there are higher rates that are dark green in the different states. And so, um, the I, and on the right, the IHS data, which are more likely to be updated compared to CDC, are broken down by age with about one in three elders age 65 plus have gotten the, boot, the bivalent booster and one in four age 18 plus with less at lower ages. And so these numbers for IHS are actually slightly lower still than the average US population numbers according to CDC. So actually we're now behind overall. So it is true that Early in the pandemic, American and Alaska Native communities, tribal nations were very successful in the vaccination um, rates. But I think we have to face the reality that we are starting to lag behind even the overall US population in overall numbers. I know that some tribal communities are still doing better, but some are still struggling. There's just a lot of disinformation and challenges out there. I know. My perspective on this is not popular, but the data really do tell the story and show the need. In fact, the stories that we are leading the nation might be hurting our efforts right now. So that's why every effort to increase vaccination rates can make a difference. And the Association of American Indian Physicians efforts are an important part of these efforts to help protect our culture through vaccination from with messages from trusted American Indian and Alaska Native physicians. So that's why the AAIP, COVID-19, and influenza vaccination initiatives continue to be an important addition to the efforts to prevent COVID-19 and influenza in Indian country. AAIP's work focuses on interventions to improve vaccine coverage in Indian country and implement effective strategies to reduce disparities in adult vaccination coverage. AAIP does this work through outreach and engagement with American Indians and Alaska Natives, dissemination of information, partnership with regional COVID task forces led by American Indian and Alaska Native physicians who help with education and dissemination and partnerships with other entities. AEIP's overall strategy is based on the message, protect our culture, ensuring tribal cultures survive and are preserved for future generations. Now, AAIP is fortunate to have member physicians working in American Indian, Alaska Native communities and in other sectors who can help disseminate resources to encourage vaccination. This slide shows a picture of the current AAIP board of directors. The current president is Dr. Luke John Day, and he's on the upper left. And many of these physicians are featured in AAIP's educational materials and campaign initiatives. The members of AAIP are valuable resources regarding vaccination success, suggesting vaccination material language, vaccination strategy recommendations, and trends in COVID-19 virus and variants. They have provided interviews to native news outlets participated as speakers in educational sessions at AAIP and at other national conferences. Here is AAIP's aaipvax.org website for their initiative, and it is the Center of Outreach and Dissemination. It includes information about COVID-19 and other vaccines, resources such as public service announcements or PSAs, both video and radio, and 
blog posts authored by AAIP physician members. And AAIP partnered with Freestyle OKC to develop this website as a way to distribute campaign information and public service announcements or PSAs. AAIP also uses its conferences for dissemination in addition to their annual convention in late summer, early fall, they hold a yearly, and they hold a yearly cross-cultural medicine workshop coming up actually in April, where vaccination resources can be disseminated in the context of presentations on how to help preserve our culture and traditions. Now AAIP has held in the last couple of years, a total of seven COVID-19 workshops and educational sessions at four different AAIP workshops and conferences for about 425 participants and participated in four webinars and town halls for about 250 participants. AAIP also has a series of radio and video public service announcements that feature American Indian Alaska Native physicians delivering messages to promote vaccination with the same theme of protecting our culture and how COVID-19 and influenza put our culture at risk. These video PSAs are running in key markets, which with large American Indian Alaska Native populations such as Oklahoma, Minnesota, and Washington, and plans are to expand to California, New Mexico, New York, and the entire Eastern US through USAT uh, tribal organization. There have been thousands of viewers of these PSAs so far. They are posted on the aaipvax.org websites and the AAIP YouTube channel. All right, here's an example of one of our video PSAs with the culture at risk theme. I'm going to attempt to play it, so here we go. COVID-19 presents a new risk to our elders and the traditions that they carry with them. Thankfully, COVID-19 vaccines are safe and they work. I'm vaccinated for those culture bearers, those language speakers, those elders. I am vaccinated because I want to be there for my family. It protects my relatives, my community. By getting the shot, that's the quickest way that we can all get back to normal. We band together and we protect our communities. Help us end this pandemic. Learn more at aaipvax.org. All right, Whew. that one showed. <laughs> All right, well, AAIP has also developed and disseminated a number of radio PSAs featuring American Indian Alaska Native physicians delivering consistent messages about the importance of vaccination. The radio PSAs have been distributed through native specific programs on national public radio and multiple other radio stations. AAIP is partnering with a public relations firm, the Gooden Group, on these radio and video PSAs, press release, releases, and brochures. Now here's an example of one of the radio PSAs. Honde Onde Batsan. I am Dr. James Kennedy, a physician at the University of Oklahoma Medical Center and a member of the Association of American Indian Physicians and the Kiowa Tribe. In 1971, American Indian and Alaska Native Physicians launched AAIP to improve and protect the health of indigenous cultures. AAIP encourages all American Indians and Alaska Natives eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine to get vaccinated to preserve our tribal cultures for future generations. That one played also. All right. Well, AAIP also developed many brochures, blog posts, and social media graphics, all of which again are available for download on the aaipvax.org website. The AAIP email listserv has approximately 3,500 members, and AAIP disseminated a total of 130 COVID 19 and influenza related articles through the website email, listserv, and social media. 
AAIP also helps amplify materials developed by partner organizations. Here are some materials from the National Council of Urban Indian Health and the Urban Indian Health Institute. They're doing an amazing job. And the posters on the right about vaccinations are examples of how partners translate them into the local languages. And these were created by the Albuquerque Area Southwest Tribal Epidemiology Center. Again, all focusing on culturally based messages that we actually already know uh, work the best. AAIP's work has mostly focused on COVID-19 so far, but this year, the focus will be on more resources to encourage vaccination in children, pregnant women, and to focus more on influenza vaccination. These again are ways to help ensure our communities thrive. If you want further information, you can go to the AAIP website or straight to the aaipvax.org website. And you can even download some of the materials yourself. And thank you, Kelly, for putting the links to those websites in the chat. And thank you. And I'm very happy to answer any questions if I have time left. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubido. Are there any um, questions for Dr. Rubido about her presentation or more information about AAIP? Let me check the chat here. Is there any? The slides are now available in the chat if you'd like copies of those. Okay. Thank you. Someone must have a question. Feel free. <laughs> it's your chance. Even if you want to type it in the chat, that's fine. I have a question. Is Charmaine Ruddock mm -hmm. from the National Music Coalition? Dr. Rubido, you may have said this and I, I may have missed this, but what were the major areas of resistance, if any, to, um, to folks getting the vaccine? Well, I had the opportunity in my prior job to hear what tribal leaders are facing as they are trying to um, encourage their communities to get vaccinations. And some communities, it wasn't a problem, but there were some communities around the country where it was. And it tended to be sort of the same issues that other communities are facing. There's been a lot of disinformation about vaccines. Um, there's a lot of hesitancy because it's a new technology. Uh, there's a lot of rumors. And so that's the most important thing to remember about American Indians, and Alaska Natives, their reservations and tribal lands or wherever they live, they're all around the country. So they are very diverse and experience the same things that other people are experiencing. So the reasons for their not wanting to get the vaccine are actually from what I've heard pretty similar. I think that there, um, there was a bit of an advantage because you know, in the history of American Indians and Alaska Natives, there have been uh, epidemics before, and we certainly know the impact uh, that they had on, on people in the past couple of, uh, past 100 or 200 years or for that. Uh, so, you know, getting vaccinated to help survive and help our culture survive really was very powerful. But I do think some of the disinformation did hit our communities and that was a big issue. And tribal leaders were asking for solutions, like how do we counter the disinformation? Thank you. Let's see, I see in the um, chat, can you provide some sample of the messaging for parents on vaccinating their children against COVID-19? What are the best practices for parents 
And again, it goes to that sort of future generations message of, you know, our children now are going to be our leaders in future generations, and we need to preserve our culture and traditions. And so those have, have been the most, it all kind of ties into it. I think um, many of us have been involved in uh, focus groups of the American Indians and Alaska Natives, especially Gail Marshall's on the phone um, or on the Zoom. Uh, we've heard these repeated things about the most successful is about helping us survive and thrive and for future generations and to help protect our culture and our traditions. And so that's, um, that's there. The next question, does the number of physicians you mentioned include working in urban areas? Uh, yeah, actually the data from the AAMC comes from the AMA master file, the American Medical Association. So that's everybody who's a physician that they've tracked that identifies as American and Alaska Native regardless of their place of work. So yeah, it's way low. We are the most underrepresented. Um, let's see, I think we're probably getting up to time. Um, yes, well, you can answer the um, next two questions and I think that will take us right to the time. Okay, how do, AAIP rates compared to African American communities. I think back on the slide where for COVID-19, um, we're still the highest cases, hospitalizations and deaths of all, um, uh, all of the um, racial and ethnic groups. In terms of vaccination rates, um, you can go to the CDC website on their vaccination um, and they, you can click on an area that shows it by race and ethnicity. And I, I don't have that up right now, but I, I think that's a good place to track it and see how it's doing. Um, someone will have to interpret um, the next question for me. Oh boy. I also wanna say that I think um, Tom Anderson is in the um, in the audience. I just noticed he is the executive director of the Association of American Indian Physicians, and he's been an integral part of this. So, Tom, wave your hand so everybody knows who you are. Thank you, Dr. Rubino. Appreciate that. <clears throat> All right. Are there any other questions? Um, or are we going to? Have this is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, Jamie Hopkins, your, your friendly uh, uh, chat box monitor. So the translation for that question is, uh, what's the percentage of vaccination, what are the vaccination rates among Native American communities, if you have that information? Yeah, so I go back to uh, this slide. So if you look at data from the Indian, oops, data from, oops, wait a minute. Data from the Indian Health Service, federal entities is down here. This is CDC. Mm -hmm. So the color of IHS matches some of the lowest colors. The darker colors mean more. For the Indian Health Service data, and that's just people served by the Indian Health Service, is 7% for the latest updated bivalent booster dose compared to the overall US average is 16%. So while American Indians and Alaska Natives had the highest rates of vaccination in the first year of the pandemic. Um, what's happened over time is I think that um, there's just been more and more difficulty getting everybody to get the bivalent booster dose. The numbers are low for the whole country, um, but you can see that um, for American Indians and Alaska Natives from IHS data even, um, these percentages are just slightly lower when you compare to the data on the CDC website. So I encourage y'all to go to the CDC website for vaccination data, and you can catch up and see for your group uh, or for your state. I think it's fascinating to look at the states in terms of their percent. Um, like the dark percent is 25% and up, and the light percent is zero to nine percent so or the light color is zero to nine percent so it's interesting to look at this new cdc covid19 uh, vaccination rates and you should be able to get to that website okay thank you again dr Rubido. excellent presentation appreciate your time 
And um, if there are any other questions that um, come up in the chat, I'm sure we can answer them as other presenters um, get ready for their presentation. So thank you once again. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay. Get situated here. The oops, on my screen, and that's the wrong screen I'm sharing. <laughs> One second. For your patience as we transition here. Okay. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce Nora Hernandez and also Fred Sandoval. So Nora has been involved in public health for over 16 years. She received a bachelor in science and a master's in business administration from the University of Texas at El Paso. In 2017, Nora was certified in public health by the Board of Public Health Examiners and selected as a population health scholar by Academy Health, making her one of only 10 health leaders nationwide recognized with this honor. Nora's public health work includes tobacco control, launching regional media campaigns promoting prevention and cessation, tobacco-free campus policies, smoke-free housing, clean indoor outdoor air ordinances, nutrition, active living, and COVID-19. Currently, she is working on mitigating the impact of COVID-19 among farm workers, dairy and meat packing workers in three counties and two states. This project has earned her team the National Hispanic Science Network's National Award of Excellence in Innovative Advances in Service for their collective and collaborative efforts. Nora finds it rewarding being engaged in the community and serves on the board of directors of Moms on Board and is a Girl Scouts troop leader to 15 active, inquisitive, and creative girls. Next slide, please. In, immediately following Nora, Fred Sandoval will give his presentation. Fred has over 38 years professional experience in health and human services. Fred is executive director for the National Latino Behavioral Health Association. Under his leadership, NELBA operates both the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction and Prevention Transfer Technology Centers. Fred recently presented as a thought leader to the Satcher Health Leadership Institute Data Consortium and the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute on the Latino Mental Health Crisis. He has served as a member of the SAMHSA Healthcare Reform Community of Practice, and he formally and he was formally appointed by Governor Bill Richardson as a Deputy Secretary of Health. Fred has also participated in President George W. Bush's announcement of the new Freedom Commission in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and served on the Hispanic Mental Health Congress during the President Clinton administration. He received his master's in public administration from Northern Arizona University and received his bachelor's of university studies from the University of New Mexico. He has and continues to serve on numerous national, regional, and community boards, councils, commissions, and committees. Nora, please go ahead and start the presentation. Well, happy Tuesday, everyone. Feliz Martes a todos y todas. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share our experiences uh, during this National COVID-19 Resiliency Network uh, Regional Community Coalition meeting. Um, as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has presented a variety of challenges, uh, health, uh, social, economic, mental, over the last three years. 
Um, but yet it has also provided us an opportunity to engage in creative ways um, and to find approaches that are effective and that can be utilized post pandemic. And so I will share with you uh, this project we have been working on to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 among farm and food production workers and building networks and partnerships that will be designed and have been designed to bring sustainable resiliency. So um, the University of Texas at El Paso has been a strategic partner of Morehouse School of Medicine's National COVID-19 Resiliency Network. And our efforts have entailed engaging with farm and food production workers. And so that's farm workers, dairy workers, and meatpacking workers in three counties, El Paso and more in Texas and in Southern Doña Ana in New Mexico. And some of this work has also entailed some of the surrounding counties. Um, so we have formed formal partnerships with four community-based organizations, and I'd like to recognize them. We have Ayuda, Familias Triunfadoras, Doña Ana County, which operates much like a community-based organization, and Family Support Services of Amarillo. And these organizations mobilize community health leaders, um, that's community health workers, promotores de salud, to go out to the fields, the dairies, the meatpacking plants, and other locations where this priority population and their families congregate. Um, we know community health workers are highly respected and they have been the frontline public health workers who are trusted and they have a close understanding of the communities and we have been maximizing um, their knowledge and expertise to reach our priority population. And so this is a map of where the counties are located. You see Doña Ana County is in the southern part of New Mexico and borders Texas. El Paso is the oval at the center and borders the state of Chihuahua, Mexico. And Moore County is located in the Panhandle area of Texas. And so these counties have been selected uh, because there's a predominantly Hispanic Latino communities with sizable numbers of farm and food production workers. And so therefore they were highly susceptible to COVID-19. El Paso and Southern Doña Ana counties are on the U.S.-Mexico border and concentrate in irrigated farming with large seasonal and smaller permanent workforces. Texas is a major sending state for migrant workers in the U.S. Um, therefore, workers may spend part of the year in Texas working in agriculture, then migrate to other parts during the planting and harvesting season. And so migrant workers tend to travel in these migratory streams, depending on weather, crop conditions, and work opportunities. There are also large dairies and a meatpacking plant in southern Doña Ana County. And so many of the farm workers who work in Doña Ana and El Paso counties, they live in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, and therefore migrating between both countries, U.S. and Mexico on a regular basis. Moore County is further uh, away from the border in the Texas Panhandle, but has a major meatpacking plant and numerous irrigated farms and employ Hispanics, Latinos. And so um, our project started relatively with the, with the small scope of work, and that was to disseminate culturally and linguistically appropriate information on COVID-19. Yet at the height of the pandemic, we learned of the needs of our priority population. They were reporting high levels of fear of becoming infected, packing plants were shutting down because of the spread, and there was a, a farm workers and COVID-19 study that reported that farm workers did not have access to protective equipment. So as part of our project, we were able to acquire and distribute protective equipment, which consisted of face masks, hand sanitizers, disinfecting wipes, and gloves to this population. Um, in addition, all the organizations we have been partnering up with, they have been leveraging additional material, and they've included additional disposable face masks, um, personal hygiene products, as well as home cleaning supplies. And so as the vaccine became available, although limited in our communities, we heard of the challenges our priority population were facing when registering for the vaccine. And that included the lack of technology, 
the lack of knowledge of how to work the technology or not having access to the internet. Um, also, a lot of the enrollment forms were only in English, which were very difficult to navigate for uh, Spanish monolingual speakers. And so we equipped our community health workers with iPads and hotspots, and we provided them training on how to enroll farm and food production workers and their families for the vaccine. So as the vaccine became broadly available to the general population, there were reports of uh, vaccine hesitancy. So we conducted focus groups to better understand the vaccine hesitancy. Yet what was reported by our priority population were barriers, the, the lack of access, the lack of transportation to vaccination sites, because many of these, uh, many of these within our priority population reside in rural communities that don't have access to public trans transportation or they lack their personal transportation. They also reported uh, limited hours of operation of vaccination clinics because for many within our priority population, missing a day of work is not an option. And they were also reporting a lack of childcare. So we brought together community partners to host vaccination events where they reside. So apartment complexes that are dedicated to migrant workers or within close proximity of where they work or, or in locations where a priority population congregates. We also provided transportation to vaccination sites evening and weekend vaccination events. We provided options for drive-through so that they could bring their children and wait in the vehicles um, during their observation period. And so we were really trying to address the, all those barriers that were identified. Um, again, using the equipment that we had provided the community health workers, the iPads and the hotspots, then we went out to help out our priority population register for the free at-home COVID-19 tests. So again, recognizing the, the value that community health workers um, bring to public health and, and to our project, um, we were able to provide them with the protective equipment, the, the training and education, up-to-date information. And one of the things that we do is uh, meet on a monthly basis to discuss lessons learned, best practices, and also we wanted to discuss what are the things that they were seeing and hearing from our communities. So along with uh, organizations from our region, a reduce the risk work group was developed and print collateral in English and Spanish on different topics that included the proper use of face masks as to why it was important for, for the general population to wear them, civic responsibilities. So what to do if someone tested positive, if you tested positive um, in order to protect your coworkers and family members. And we also wanted to address um, mass gatherings since we recognized that there was going to be times within the year that people wanted to congregate. And so, we also have been creating and continuously update county specific resource guides with information such as COVID-19 testing and vaccination sites, child care, financial assistance, funeral assistance, food and pantry services that are specific to each of the regions. And so these are some of the results for each of our priority population groups. Um, I'm reporting some of the farm workers, the number of farms and fields visited, number of farm workers registered for the vaccine, as well as farm workers and their family members being vaccinated, and then the distribution of the COVID-19 tests. Um, because of the migratory nature of farm workers, many traveling back to Mexico daily or on weekends, um, on extended breaks. It is important that we keep these workers safe, protected, and healthy. And so these are the numbers for dairy workers. Um, you know, during the pandemic, at the, at the height of the pandemic, um, many of these workers continued their milking operations to provide these essential food services. And given the location of farms and dairies in rural communities, Reaching dairy workers as well as farm workers has not been an easy feat, um, yet the community health leaders have been successful in reaching uh, these hard to reach populations. 
Meatpacking workers, we know that um, they were also highly susceptible to getting and spreading the virus because of their, their close proximity to working with one another. Um, but our community health leaders have built that rapport with supervisors of meatpacking plants in order to allow them access to, to meatpacking workers. And so overall, we've had great success in building strong partnerships with organizations, with community health leaders, and then also with um, reaching our priority population and developing long-term relationships with community partners. And so for some of the best practices, um, we recognize that messaging is crucial. Designing culturally and linguistically appropriate information is, is vital, um, but also the, the, the delivery. And so having a collective and cohesive message of protecting our communities, of those effective protective measures, and um, the support that was happening within our communities has been something um, that I'd like to highlight. And so we worked closely with organizations like the Paso de Norte Health Foundation, Texas A&M, Texas Tech, um, Texas Department of State Health Services to deliver a consistent and similar message. And then um, we also recognize that partnerships and relationships are important. Um, the relationships between the university and the community-based organizations, the community-based organizations and the community health workers, the community health workers, and then the priority population. And then, of course, some of these broader relationships that we've been able to develop with More Health School of Medicine, with uh, NCRN strategic partners to include the University of South Florida, University of Chicago North, and uh, the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, who you'll be hearing from shortly. But all of these partnerships and relationships have been vital to the success of, of the project. And uh, just to give a little plug to the social, uh, to the Connections podcast, um, Dr. Mack and, and Romero Davis uh, from Social Current touched on the importance of, of partnerships and collaboration. And then lastly, um, the information sharing to modify strategies. So as I shared, uh, hosting these monthly partner meetings have provided us that opportunity to share what community health workers were seeing and hearing so that then we could modify our strategies to better meet the needs of the priority population. And so much like the virus, we had to be flexible and nimble um, to modify our tactics to better serve the priority population. And so this project has combined research, community outreach, and advocacy in farm working, meatpacking, and dairy communities. And we've been recording these valuable lessons uh, from this applied project implementation. All of these efforts and results have been team driven and couldn't be done without the support and dedication of each of them. So I would first like to acknowledge the internal team at uh, the University of Texas at El Paso for their direction and support. We have Dr. Heyman, Dr. Porado, Adriana Orozco, uh, Dr. Nunez Michiri, and Dr. Juarez Carrillo. And as well as the organizations we have been partnering with to assist with the outreach to our priority population. By working together, our goal is to have positive, long lasting impact. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. And now I will turn the virtual microphone over to Fred Sandoval. Well, Nora. Thank you so much. What it was what a great presentation. And of course, I want to give kudos to yourself and Dr. Rubudo for your presentations. And uh, before I get started, um, much thanks to the team at uh, Morehouse University School of Medicine and particularly the efforts of NCERN, the acronym we use for our um, National COVID Resiliency Network and the strategic partnership that we've had with uh, the teams. But more importantly, thank you so much for this opportunity to share a particular effort that we've been engaged with. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And this way we can uh, begin with um, our presentation. So I'm going to touch base particularly on our efforts on what is an outreach and mitigation effort to provide education in the farm worker communities in South Florida. 
And this we did in a very unique way. This was a collaboration uh, through what we call a culture broker. And this particular effort engaged uh, our organization and another agency who works specifically in the farm worker community called Centro Campesino. So with that, I'd like to say a little bit about the organization so that you'll have some background about NALBA, which is the National Latino Behavioral Health Association. Our organization was formed out of the National Hispanic Mental Health Congress that was convened under uh, the President Clinton administration. Uh, the national leadership group that was convened there uh, had one recommendation, that was the formation of a National Latino Behavioral Health Association, and thus this organization, our agency. And our particular vision and mission is really in looking at the disparities that have been experienced by the Latino Hispanic population in the United States who are struggling with behavioral health conditions. Our focus is to address those particular disparities through policy advocacy by addressing the, the gaps in services and having strategies that allow us to make improvements in respect to those areas. So having said that, uh, part of our efforts at the National Latino Behavioral Association was to work very closely with community partners across the country. And part of our network called the Juntos Network, which I'll say a little bit more a little bit later, really was intended to really help us in our partnership efforts on this particular national effort to be able to look at special populations that were experiencing those conditions that we all now are very intimately familiar with in terms of who was impacted by COVID and to what degrees and the unique conditions that were being faced by the populations in the United States. So in this instance, we were targeting the farm worker community and it being certainly one of the hot spots very early on at the start of the pandemic led us to then find a cultural broker who has an intimate knowledge of the farm worker community because of their longevity in that particular part of the country and that particular population. Central Campesino was founded in 1972. So this is very much right at the height of the Chicano movement in the United States. And it's in large measure because of the role that the farm worker community had been playing in the United States for most of the 1900s. It was because of the deployment of farm workers across the United States in those agricultural states who are significant to producing the food of the United States. And we know that the farm worker community can be found across the nation, but particularly and highly concentrated in 38 of the states in the United States. And for that reason, we reached out to Centro Campesino to be able to look at these issues in a way where we could collaborate to bring our expertise combined with their expertise to support an effort to mitigate the impact that COVID was having in the farm worker community in Florida. So in this case, Centro Campesino's efforts, uh, as you can imagine, because of its history in serving that population has led to the development of significant community programs and resources, and it highly concentrated its efforts in the southern part of the state of South Florida. So because of that concentration, we wanted to be able to have an impact in such a way that we could support a community-based organization, be able to develop its capacity, its efforts around COVID and how to initiate uh, a mitigation strategy. So this particular partnership really helped us to concentrate on this particular effort. I, as you see this picture here, um, I want you to know that oftentimes what most of us don't recognize is oftentimes farm workers are, are really up before dawn to do much of the work that's involved. And because of the unique conditions that they work in, and we're all very familiar with some of those conditions, it's just a reminder that one is, well, these individuals are being impacted by incredible labor demands, they are also in certain working conditions being impacted. So when a pandemic hits, you can already start to see the multiplier effect of the risks and the challenges, and now even the barriers as we know them. So here's some data that I'd like to share with you since July of last year to the present. And the reason I picked this particular uh, data set is because over the uh, two and a half years we've worked closer with Central Campesino, we really evolved to ensuring that we could capture data, that they could report the data of the work that they were doing. And this level of maturity and this level of effort, the concentrated efforts to begin to really 
initiate COVID uh, activities is very telling, right? Because keep in mind that many community-based organizations across the country and other elements of the system of care were in fact not prepared to do any work in relationship to COVID. And so for many, it was really starting from ground zero. So in addition to ground zero, then we are also now working in a very community grassroots oriented strategy. And in a very short period of time, the organization starts to engage in all the various types of activities. And so this data helps to represent what has taken place just in recent months. Uh, prior to that, there was also the activities that were being reported to us and we wanted to share you know, what's happening really as of late as they start to reach this pinnacle of continued efforts with COVID mitigation. Um, what's incredibly significant is that the pop-up clinics that were developed just recently uh, is very telling about how to engage even more effectively in the communities. And the efforts to then ensure that vaccines could take place started to help increase that effort, particularly in the farm worker community, because of the trusted relationship that the farm worker community has with Central Campesino. And they use different methods to be able to engage and support the vaccine recipients through the use, in this case, of gift cards. Uh, the efforts around education, uh, this is incredibly significant, right? Because what's happened is, one, um, and I'll say more about this in the next slide, about what is unique to each state and how it is that in the case of farm worker communities, how is it that they get access to information that comes from uh, state agencies or even from federal agencies? So you could see the canvassing efforts here were, have been and can have continued to be very significant, while in this case ranging well over 13,000. So concurrently with that is then the efforts to ensure that there was testing taking place and that uh, the access to PPE was being made available. And all of that as a result of uh, in the emergence of increased special events. So you could see that as this effort took place over that period of time, this data shows the, the extensive nature of their efforts just in a very short period of time. Well, of course, as with anything, and we're all very familiar with this, right? You know, as public health experts or advocates or citizens that are concerned, individuals who are in the workforce, we experience the barriers and challenges firsthand. Each state is different, each community is different, and it affects populations differently. So these are some of the characteristics that were noted as part of our collaboration with Central Campesino. And in their instance, uh, it was very evident there was very limited state involvement and leadership. So for other of us, many of us, we often experienced just the opposite, where there was great uh, state involvement and there was great state leadership. While in an environment where that isn't the case, it's going to have a dramatic impact on how the populations in that state can have access to the resources that are critical to mitigate and reduce the risks associated with this pandemic. As a result of that uh, situation, that policy environment, it also impacts the access to federal funding to mitigate those conditions. So if you have a state where that isn't happening and this was taking place here, this is what it creates. It creates an environment where the partnerships in communities is taking place at the community level and not as much with the state or the state agencies and all the array of agencies who have responsibilities regarding the public health of individuals in those states. And of course, initially there was limited access to PPE. All of us are familiar with how that happened, the challenges associated with that. We also know that early on, limited access to the vaccine had a dramatic impact. And in states where there was less effort to ensure vaccines were made available to the population, we had circumstances that we found with the farm worker community, which was a very limited access. And then you are in a situation where there was high rates of COVID cases and deaths. Uh, we do know that in Miami-Dade County, which has a population of uh, over 2.6 million, there was a significant number of cases um, that were, uh, were that were occurring, and then also the number of deaths that took place. But in acknowledging that, this is what we also started to see emerge. As a result of this partnership with NCERN, and then our partnership with the community-based efforts of Central Campesino, we are helping to facilitate and provide information 
uh, make connections to resources. And by doing so, it was because we deployed a cultural broker strategy that is very effective. So for organizations who don't work extensively with Hispanic serving or Hispanic led organizations, this is the strategy that I would encourage you to look at. And that is a cultural broker strategy. It means you're tapping into the assets, the strengths in communities where there are community organizations that serve Latino populations very effectively. So this is a strategy we deployed, recognizing that we could support an organization to build its capacity to help mitigate COVID in the farm worker community. And of course, uh, Centro Campesino since 1972 now has an incredible history, well over 50 years, of uh, being a trusted community-based organization. All of those years of experience, particularly in the farm worker community, is very telling. And it's how is it that we can then help support those efforts? And you're going to see here shortly some of the other successes that, that happened as a result of Centro Campesino's uh, leadership. They worked very closely at the local level and collaborating with other groups. So you can see up on the slide here some information about the different types of groups that they partnered with. And if you notice, of course, there's the absence of the kind of the public aspects of what could have happened there. But was essential, and this is very important, uh, the messaging from my colleague there, uh, John Martinez, who's the executive director, was when there's a need and there's a gap, you work to fill that need and that gap. And you do it with the collaborators who are prepared and willing to address those issues as they present themselves. And what we know is that community engagement approach that they've used for many years meant that they could very readily ensure that the farm worker participants, the individuals receiving services from the agency, could then serve as the influencers and communicators of the strategy and the messaging and the efforts about these community resources. What surfaces is this, and this was an area we particularly wanted to pay attention to, and that was ensuring that we understood what is the impact of the person's mental health and all of our efforts in our partnership with uh, Morehouse University School of Medicine. Because in large measure, the United States was experiencing a mental health crisis and then now coupled by the impact of a pandemic where mental health became one of the most significantly talked about issues in the country. And it's going to continue to be, and in large measure, it was because of this particular pandemic that it, it really impacted all age groups across the lifespan across the country. So the awareness that came out of this uh, regarding mental health and the impact on farm workers became known to us even more so. Keeping in mind that in the farm worker community, oftentimes they themselves may be the ones who don't benefit from the information or resources that they can qualify for, are eligible for, or can receive. And so we found that one is this allowed us to help focus on how to ensure that the COVID uh, information available in terms of resources and information could be made available to them. And um, the Juntos Network, as I referenced earlier, is NALBA's communication hub. This is, represents well over 12,000 unduplicated individuals across the country that we partner with, communicate with, that we provide services to, and we were able through that particular effort ensure that we could find and, and collaborate with the partners such as uh, Centro Campesinos. And what we know is that that grassroots engagement is what was critically needed in this instance. And that's what led to that collaborative partnership. And what we also know, it helped bring the federal resources that were made available through the insert effort to be able to bring it down to the community level, to the grassroots level, to be able to share that information. And keeping in mind that Centro Campesino is you know, certainly one of several groups that we have worked with. Uh, another one that we worked with was Mano y Corazón. And here's some messaging, right? It says, la cultura cura y la vacuna nos asegura, right? In, in English, that would be um, uh, culture is healing and the vaccination assures us. And we wanted to have culturally and linguistically appropriate messaging and one of the ways that we do that is through something called platicas, where we were able to deploy a large number of live Facebook platicas with community resources who were making efforts to address the COVID pandemic throughout the country. And in this instance, here's the illustration we did uh, by inviting John Martinez to present on his efforts and the different groups with which we have partnered with and continue to partner with. 
So I want to say thank you. Uh, so I think I probably have reached my 15 minute limit. And more importantly is please uh, put some questions in the chat. I'll put my email address or if you can just go ahead and get it from here. I think the PowerPoint will be made available to you too. It will certainly be an opportunity to um, have some further dialogue. Uh, and we're very uh, uh, excited to say that uh, we were going to make the Platicas an ongoing effort uh, because of the impact it has had. So um, again, thank you so much. Thank you, both Fred and Nora. Do we have any questions for them? We have a few more minutes uh, before we close out with Dr. Mack. Any questions or comments for Fred or Nora? See a lot of thank yous. That's great. Wow. Any questions? <laughs> so we'll take thank yous and comments, by the way. So okay. Uh... I had a question. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Um, I was just curious, what did you see as the, as the biggest challenge in, in your partnership um, with the different community organizations when trying to uh, reach the farm workers? Uh, great question. Um, you know, um, this is going to uh, uh, really kind of say something that uh, for some could be interpreted in a very unique way. The partnership itself didn't, we didn't experience any barriers or challenges. In fact, it was the opposite. It strengthened the working relationship in that partnership. So we had that effect. What we had, we had to recognize as an organization is the context, the environment in, of that community-based organization and the barriers and challenges that were being you know, put in front of their, their efforts because of the lack of state engagement. And whatever level of state engagement took place was beyond their control. But really, the, I think the barriers and challenges to getting to serve even more farm worker community was probably the lack of resources that could have been brought to bear from the federal agencies and from state agencies. And so that's an, an example of where as public policy advocates or as advocates for the well-being of those populations who are in our respective states, is that that was a barrier, obviously, that would need some additional attention. Right now, uh, I'll just summarize by simply saying this, the partnership itself was a powerful mechanism. It was the absence of the resources that were needed to support that effort by those organizations that are publicly charged with the responsibility for the health, welfare, and safety of their residents. Thank you. Any follow-up from you, Nora? No, so that is a great question. And we've been very fortunate that the community-based organizations who we've partnered up with um, have that uh, trust um, from the community. And hence, that really allowed for what we classify as gatekeepers to allow us to then bring our teams and have those conversations with their workers. And so I'm very fortunate to have worked with an amazing team that has really gained that trust from the community that they knew what they were, uh, that the, the gatekeepers knew what they were there for, which was to protect their workers. And I think that relationship has been extremely valuable. Thank you. We know partnership and collaboration has been very key to um, having the success that we've had among our strategic partners across the entire network. All right, any other? All right, still lots of thank yous. Okay, if there are no other questions or uh, comments for any of our presenters, I am gonna turn it over to Dr. Matt for him to um, close us out and um, say make any other comments he has. Thank you, and um, thank you again to our presenters and our speakers today. Um, we have to say that this is all because of, well, some of it's because of the funding that we receive for the Office of Minority Health. Without that funding, a lot of this work would not be able to be done. And as you've seen with our previous RCC meetings, um, these funds have been distributed to our partners within the community. And we just want to say thank you to the Office of Minority Health, 
uh, for this opportunity to work with these um, these um, partners that we have who've done such great work. But today specifically, I want to thank Dr. Rubido, um, the, the message she shared about the challenges that are ongoing, but also the early success in the American in, Indian and Alaska Native community. I uh, want to thank Ms. Hernandez. Um, thank her for, it was interesting to hear about the migration patterns and but also thank you for the great work that you all have done um, to successfully reach farm workers, the meat packers, et cetera, <clears throat> um, in the areas in which you serve. And then um, Mr. Sandoval, Fred, he brought an interesting term up and concept when he talked about the cultural broker strategy. So, um, I hope you coin that, Fred, because uh, we all will be using that. Uh, so thank you for the great work that you've done and, and all of you in the American Indian, Alaska Native and Hispanic communities. So thank you for the information you conveyed today. And we want to thank all our guests. And you all have a great evening. We hope to see you on the next meeting. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.